You know what I want. Maybe the last, maybe not the last, but definitely, potentially one of the most important of the quote unquote definitive draft podcasts that for whatever reason I've had the, uh, the arrogance to name them. But this one is for Jalen Suggs, who it seems like could be the most realistic and the betting line might recognize him as the most likely player to be a Raptor in that first jumble of players to discuss him somebody who is very well acquainted with Gonzaga, who is very well acquainted with Jalen Suggs' game. He's a NBA freelance writer. He covers everything in the league. And when I say everything, I mean everything. The catalog of work is expansive. And not only that, but it's good. And most of it for Dime Up Rocks and The Analyst. And so, Jackson Frank, friend to humanity, friend to many on NBA Twitter. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty well. Friend to humanity. I think that might be the that may that be the, the most unique uh, label I've gotten on a podcast intro uh, over my time. I think it's accurate. I've really <laughs> you've just I've so appreciated. I, I find that there's a lot of overlap in our interests when I see you not really go to war, but go to bat for a player who I feel like the the dialogue or the narrative has turned its back on. I'm like, yes, Jackson, my guy. <laughs> finally, someone says it. And not only that, but a lot of your written work, it really, I jive with it, man. Your work has been so fantastic lately and followed by personal success. So really excited to have you on at the start of what should be an excellent and extremely long career covering the NBA. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope the same. I, I hope this is just the, just the beginning, but I'm excited to talk about some Jalen Suggs and kind of everything he brings and how he might fit uh, in Toronto moving forward. Right. So... I just, from your perspective, right off the top, let's do the cliff notes of what makes Suggs an attractive player. A player who would be drafted at the top end of a, a loaded draft to some. Yeah, so I think Jalen Suggs' biggest strengths uh, are, one, his transition playmaking, and not even necessarily transition, just like his ability to get the ball up the floor so quickly. I mean, if you want to tie in why that's important, you can look at look at the Phoenix Suns in this year's playoffs where like there's a stark difference between when they get the ball up you know, nine seconds into the shot clock versus three seconds. Like you just, you just have so many more options to create things. There's, you know, the defense isn't set. So, we, so Suggs is great, you know, off of a miss pushing the ball in transition. He's great off of makes too. Like, you know, just big push ahead passes, maybe get the ball to a shooter in, in rhythm. Um, just has a really good vision there. Uh, and then defensively, he's a really, really good off ball defender um, is good at baiting teams and doing what he wants. He kind of, he likes to roam a lot off the ball, make things happen. Um, uh, so that, that's another strength of his. He's, he's pretty good on the ball defensively, um, has some things to work through, particularly kind of navigating screens, um, but can be pretty overwhelming at the point of attack still when he really gets going laterally using his strength um, because his strength, you know, is a huge plus for him, especially at the guard position for a 19 year old. Um, I think he's turned 20 by now, if I recall, but um, so those are, those are three of the biggest things. And also he's just a really smart player. When I, when I talk about this class, um, you know, assuming that Suggs can go in the top four or five, you have three really, really smart guys in this class with Cade, Evan Mobley, and, and Jalen Suggs. And, and, and Jalen sees the floor really well, exceptionally well on both ends of the floor. Um, he sees the floor well, exceptionally well on both ends of the floor. Uh, that's terrible, uh, terrible syntax for me there, addiction. Um, but just a really smart player. And then, you know, in pick and rolls, he has very good vision, especially kind of side pick and rolls, things where the defense is already a little behind the play. Um, can really make some things happen there. So those are his biggest strengths as a prospect and why he's projected to go in the top three, four, or five later in this month's draft. More Byzantine diction from you, Jackson. Please <laughs> and thanks. But uh, there was, in The Athletic Today, an article that came out where there was a screenshot of one, I believe it was a Western Conference executive, lauding his leadership, quote-unquote, his drive, all those all those superlatives that get talked about a lot with guys. Do you buy any of that? Does that, is that meaningful at all for you, especially as all of us, presumably most of us haven't met Jalen Suggs and those of us who have don't know him intimately to know his drive and all that kind of stuff. What, what does that evaluation do for you? 
I don't, it doesn't really factor in much for me. Um, I do think one of the things that is cool and maybe it's just, it's just something that we can Raptors fans can latch on to and appreciate, you know, because as you said, at the outside it does seem like he has kind of the betting favorite to, to don that Raptors cap in a few weeks. Um, is a lot of people come to Zaga talked about, oh, like he really, really embraces one year there. And that's not always the case with one and done guy. That's, and that's not a criticism of guys who just, you know, treat the, treat, you know, college as a pit stop. It's by all means, that's their right. And I totally understand it. Um, but they had a chance to do something really special at Gonzaga. And I think Suggs was a huge part of that. And it's clearly going to play a role in Gonzaga continuing to be a, you know, a destination for, for some of the top prospects. So it's not something that I really value in my, you know, in my evaluation. Um, there I go again using kind of you know uh, redundant <laughs> words, but um, this is why this is why I write. I like to be able to read things before they uh, make the public airwaves. But um, I think from a fan perspective, it just makes him easier to root for because he does have sort of an an effervescent personality. Like he, the amount of times at Gonzaga where he would really kind of just I mean, put his body in the line with with things, you know, dive into the floor for a loose ball, trying to fight through a screen, um, you know, jumping into the, the second row for a loose ball, things like that. Like he doesn't have to do that, right? Like I mean, he's got millions of dollars on the line if he busts up his knee going for a for a loose ball with you know a 14 point game with three minutes left like that's that's could have some consequences so um less is something that i really value in terms of how i view him as a prospect but i think you know that's that's not the only way to kind of view guys you know there's there's certainly kind of a fan element to it for sure and it, it makes you use to root for him and as a raptor fan prepare maybe you know, prepare for the jalen suggs era um i mean it's just another reason that you should you should be excited about him because i do think he really has a a gregarious personality, one that's easy to gravitate toward. Okay, so I know we're we're all talking about like, wow, these are great intangibles, great guy, effervescence. He's exuding positive energy everywhere. He embraces what's around him. That's all good. But before we get to talking about a lot of the most beneficial things that he brings to the court, we're going to discuss why he is viewed as probably the last of the big four prospects. Kuminga, it was a top five, but Kuminga has fallen in some people's eyes. So Jalen Suggs, why he's most likely to go at four based on evaluations, based on rumors, that kind of stuff, is a lack of half-court creation or a potential to be a primary. P.D. Webb, who I know you appreciate, I really appreciate, we'll talk about him and say he struggles to see him transcending past a connective player on offense. And so what are your thoughts on him and his shortcomings in that role? Yeah, I tend to side with PD on that. Um, I think his biggest issues are one, a lack of North South handle. I think he can do some things like kind of East West, you know, which I think will, will help him kind of with this pull up jumper projection, which he's grown a lot in the last couple of years, but um, North South, he really can't, can't really dribble with the ball away from his body. And if you watch the best creators, they're able to kind of keep that ball on a string, even if it's, you know, eight, you know, it's eight inches away from their body and they're dribbling one direction. Um, you know, like watch, like watch Chris Paul, watch Devin Booker, you know, in, in these finals games. Um, and you just, you, you can just tell how they're able to get to spots without the ball being connected to the hip. Whereas Suggs, when he tries to drive downhill most of the time, that ball has to be right at his side. And, and that's tough. That, that makes it tougher. Like if, if the ball, people talk about the ball being an extension of your body, he doesn't really have that. And so that, that hurts kind of, how and how and where he can get to spots on the floor and part of that too is he's the phrase I like to use is he's tightly contained and I think it's because of kind of a lack of flexibility at times he can't quite maneuver around players or extend around guys to get to the spots he wants and so those are the biggest reasons I think he struggles as a half court creator at times because you know the ball has to be at his side and he can't really wiggle his way around guys like I mean if we're going to compare him to someone maybe uh, you know, you look at a guy like Shagel and Alexander, who can just kind of, you know, flow around any defender and kind of, you know, just adapt his body because he's so flexible and, and whatnot to get to his spots. And just so he doesn't have that. And, and, and so that's not to, that's not to say well, he, he can't be a great player or that he, he has to be Shagel and Alexander, but just comparing two guys there in terms of the difference and how that'll help them. This is the biggest thing I see with Suggs is kind of, he just, he just kind of bottled up a lot, whether which with the ball or his, or his body. Yeah, and for a frame of reference for the listener, you brought up Booker and Paul. And to get even more specific, like an example of that would be Chris Paul getting downhill. And you spoke about wiggle and flexibility, but it's also the ability to keep the handle while throwing the ball ahead into space. 
and evaluating everybody else around you to move within that space. And you're the guy in control of all of that. And I have seen that in what I've seen from Jalen Suggs' game is that he's explosive within himself, but Mm -hmm. it's just he doesn't separate the ball from himself. And it, it leads to more manipulation when you're talking about how you can manipulate defenders, be it at the first level of defense or at the next level of defense. Being able to control the ball outside of your body, outside of your initial cylinder, gives you more potential for that manipulation, more room to play. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a great way, great way to put it. Like there, there are ways to compensate for that. You can still create advantages in different ways, and I think the the most, and I think we'll kind of get into this a little bit. But I mean, like I mentioned earlier, like Suggs is a really smart player, um, and so I think there is there is kind of a foundation that you can at least be encouraged by um, that he'll be able to still be able to create some advantages. Like you're not going to, he, again, he's not going to be your primary creator. Like I know that some people, you know, there is, there is the idea that like we're in positionless basketball. And so I'm not going to call him. He's not a point guard, but I think he's not your lead initiator. That's the way I'll phrase it. And that's okay. Like you can still create advantages as a secondary creator. You just can't be asked to do it 49 times a game, right? Maybe maybe 15 to 20, you know, and it, because all those aren't going to be capitalized upon. Um, but it's just too much to ask him. He doesn't, he doesn't have the broad range of advantage creation. He has certain ways you think he can do it, um, but it's just tougher to be kind of a, to drive offense that way. If you know, with the, in the manner in which you can force a defense to bend to your preference uh, is a little more limited than the, the high end, you know, primary initiators. I think the, the layman way to put it would be that very rarely do you see connecting players who don't, who aren't your primary initiator make all NBA teams at the size or position that Suggs plays. If, if it's a center, there's a different set of skills that applies you know, differently to how you're reading the floor, what type of advantageous positions you're in. But Jalen Suggs, his archetype currently, what he's projected as, it's tough to see him being like that world-ending type of player who gets there. But connecting players make all-star teams all the time. So there's a reasonable upside to see there. But I think the lack of all NBA is probably what has him sitting at number four. Yeah, I think, you know, like I wouldn't be surprised if he makes a couple of all-star games. And that's, and I mean, it's, that's the thing. Whenever I like, whenever I talk about a player's ranking or I talk about how good a prospect I think a player can become, like there are roughly anywhere from 450 to 600 players that, that see NBA minutes in a season. So if you're, if you're an average starter, you're a top 75 guy, that's really good. If you're an above average starter, you're like a top 50 to 60 guy, that's really good. If you're an all-star, you're a top 25 to 35 player. I know it's a little different because there, you don't, you go across, you're kind of bound by you know, Eastern Conference, Western Conference limitations there, but that's a really good player. Like if Sugg, if, if Sugg is a top 30 player for two or three seasons, like that's a really, really good outcome. And he's a top 50, 60 guy for five or six other years. Like, like you take that, like that is it's really, really tough to do. And so um, I, by no means do I think, you know, it's, it's a knock of the guy you get at four, um, which also Toronto jumped up to four, you know, they benefit a little bit from lottery. Like the guy you get at four is a two-time all-star and, and someone who, you know, for, you know, almost a decade is a, is, is a better player on average than the average guy that he lines up against, you know, on a given night because he's a top 50 player. Like it's just, I mean, it's just a really, really, you know, 150 guys start in the NBA. If you're a top 50 player, you're in the top third of those. So, um, it's a tough feat. It's, it's a good feat. It requires you to bring a lot of value, which I think Suggs will. It's also interesting because he should be a factor fairly soon after jumping into the league because there's guys like Tobias Harris who get shipped around for a long time and don't really find their role while they develop discrete skills and swing skills and stuff like that. And then eventually boom as this player. And so the value for the team that drafted him doesn't last. But Suggs should be able to, within the context of the Raptors, provide a lot of meaningful impact right away. So I think we've made the case for why he's sitting at four. I don't want to dump on him because I do like Suggs a lot and there's a lot to like, and I know you like him a lot too. So let's do why he's such a good connecting player then. Let's dig into what makes him go as far as that. Yeah, and so I think one of the reasons he wasn't a good connecting player is because just all you have to do is like is watch one Gonzaga game or even half a Gonzaga game, maybe not even, maybe 10 minutes of a game. Um, but my point here is like, he did a lot of stuff in half in the transition as a as an offensive driver of things, you know, whether it's finding Corey Kispert for a three on the wing or finding Joel Yai streaking down the floor or making some brilliant bounce pass. But in the half court, Gonzaga ran a very motion-based, multiple ball handler thing, whether it was their going to the low post with Drew Timmy, running 
stuff with Joel Ayai, Corey Kispert. Um, like Suggs wasn't just running spread pick and roll every single time. Like he was doing a lot of things where he's attacking kind of a, a tilted defense, you know, whether it's just a simple handoff where, uh, you know, the defender is half a step late uh, and then, you know, Suggs can attack because and then flow into a pick and roll, things like that. So he's very, he, because he's such a smart player, if you have an offense or just someone who can help create little advantages that Suggs can play off of, he's going to bring you a lot of use because he's a very good passer and, and he's very good at kind of he's very good at at kind of manipulating space. So and I think the best way if, like if Raptors fans are listening to this podcast and wondering maybe the best way to get an idea of that is in the Elite Eight this year against US USC went to a zone. USC had played zone throughout the entire tournament and really kind of stifled teams. And Suggs just really, really picked apart that zone because zone provides space, right? There's pockets of space in the zone. And so um, I think that's what he does really well is if you can, if you can create space for Suggs in the half court, he's going to be able to give you a lot of surplus value offensively because he's great at taking advantage of, of advantages or season advantages there. That's the best way to you know phrase it succinctly. Um, he's not going to be the guy who who's, will create every single advantage for you, but if you create one for him, he will capitalize upon it. Like I, I'm thinking about a, a play where, um, you know, I was watching the BYU game earlier today from the WCC championship. Drew Timmy with their low post presence at Gonzaga um, sealed off his man. And it was kind of a tough angle, but Suggs was able to throw it kind of around slash over the top of the big man defender to lead Timmy into space. And I think either Timmy finished or got fouled. But so that's an example where like the advantage was created by Timmy, right? By sealing the man off and Suggs was smart and skilled enough to take advantage of it. So that's the biggest thing is he uses space really well and advantages that are created for him, you can really kind of seize those with his passing and smarts. Okay, so this is something that happened with Tyrese Halliburton this year, is a guy who definitely did not succeed as a primary, but attacking a tilted defense made a lot of great decisions in four-on-three situations, finding, you know, Rashawn Holmes for like a lob in the dunker spot or these little drop-off passes, winning the game of cat and mouse against the weak side zone, finding guys for corner threes and stuff like that. What is the most, and maybe this, you know, definition isn't perfect, but there are NBA plays that you see happen, NBA reads that you see happen at the collegiate level. What were those for Jalen Suggs that you saw most often? Yeah, so I think I think a lot of it comes in in like second side pick and roll stuff, if that makes sense. Like, you know, when when the when the defender is just a half a beat behind because he's he's trying to play, trying to catch up with with Suggs movement. Um, so those, those are where I think they happen most often. Um, no, he, he isn't in, and he's best at capitalizing those as a passer because he still does have some limitations as a finisher. Um, he's very much a two foot leaper, um, which is tough because, you know, you need a little more time to jump off two feet, right? Like it's easier if you can explode off one foot and finish. So he's best in those situations when he is, you know, making a pass or, or whatnot. Um, but that's the places I saw him work the best in terms of when I would watch a play happen. I would say, okay, that's that's a really good reflection of how he should be using in the NBA. Um, so it's those second side pick and rolls, those dribble handoffs, things like that, um, where the defender's already a step or half a step behind, and he can really work work with that to his to he and his team's benefit. Um, so that's that's really where I like him most. And that's and that's honestly similar to. To what Halliburton did this year. Um, I think Halliburton was best as a passer in the second side action. Like he did some stuff at the top of the key, you know, really, really good pocket passer has been for a handful of years now. Um, and then beyond that, it was it was just the passing from, you know, when the defense is already a little bit tilted or shifted. And then um, as a scorer, you know, Halliburton took a huge step forward as a as kind of a shooter, whether it was from deep or, you know, finding a little space when defense is ducked under. And I think that's really similar to, to Suggs. Suggs has taken strides. Um, or made strides, you know, as a as a shooter, as a pull up shooter. Um, you know, I think back to you know, there's been certain games where he's kind of gone on, you know, towards stretches as a pull up shooter. And so there's there will be hope that he can continue that growth. Um, and so those will be the biggest ways. It's you know, perimeter shooting when the guys are step late, or you know, play, you know, second side pick and roll actions where he can really kind of tap into that those smarts and that passing talent to really take advantage of, you know, okay, one guy's a step slow defensively, so another guy has to rotate, and he's out of position kind of the domino effect of what any any small advantage can can do for an offense. You wrote a piece earlier this year uh, describing R.J. Barrett's ascendance, and it was a really good piece. And I appreciated the the smaller part you had in it where you were describing the changes he made to his jumper with his, uh, with his coach, Drew Hanlon, I think. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, he's with Hanlon. Yep. Right, Drew Hanlon. And you highlighted that and that there were, you know, there was significant progression after that. Being a second side creator, being an off ball guy, you know, relative to the primary action dictates, I think, that some people will want you to be a shooter because if the shot's available, you take it. What have you made of his A, mechanics, B, efficiency, and C, the burgeoning pull up game with Jalen Suggs? Yeah, so. I, for some reason, I can't exactly recall what his mechanics looked like before he, I think he improved them. Like, I want to say he played in, he played in FIBA, I think U18 with like a bunch of guys from his class and even Halliburton, like he played with Cade, Halliburton, Mobley, I think was on the team, Jalen Green, like it was, it was a stacked team. I mean, as, as every U.S. basketball uh, squad is from, from top to bottom in terms of, you know, age levels, but um, I just recall it broadly being a little stiffer, like didn't feel all all tied together. And now even though the, the numbers weren't great this year, uh, I really liked the strides he made um, or that he made initially, I think, in high school with Mini Haha, um, where just everything looked more economical, like from top to bottom. He had nice sway with his feet. He had a good follow through. Um, his upper body looked in sync. Um, and so I just, I really do buy him as a good shooter because I just, I just like the foundation of mechanics there. And um, again, I'm, everyone does this. I, I, my, I'm not a shot doctor, so I want to preface that. Um, but I just, I just like how everything flows well together when he's really focused on it. There can be times where he'll, you know, every, a lot of players do this, especially younger ones will let the follow through go. Like he'll, he'll, he'll kind of pull it back um, or the feet will maybe sway a little bit too much or he'll kind of flare them out to the side. Um, but when they, but for the most part, I do think his jumper is fairly consistent. And when it is consistent, I like what he's working with there. So that's most encouraging, most encouraging to me. And then um, the pull-up is something that I think, like, I don't know if he can ever get to be, you know, one of the top 12 to 15 pull-up guys in the NBA or anything like that. But I think it can be a weapon for him, especially if teams try to go under screen because they know he likes to, he likes to get into the paint and make things happen. And he loves trying to attack downhill. Um, he, another thing I really liked though, that I think in terms of his scoring ability is he got a lot more comfortable working from mid range as the year went on. Um, you know, whether it was a floater, it was kind of maybe a mid range pull up when teams went under. So, um, those are things that I really do think are his best avenues to scoring value. Like, I think, I think the two foot leaping is going to hurt him a lot as a finisher, but I think there's a pull up shooting intermediate game, you know, kind of both of which are, are burgeoning or blossoming. Um, but maybe won't be there from day one in the NBA, but by, you know, maybe midway through year two and then all the way there by year three, you're looking at a guy who has, you know, a two, two and a half level scorer. And you can really kind of buy and bank on him as a, as a reliable secondary creator, maybe a one, one B, probably more of a two full two there. But um, I really do think there are some interesting avenues for him to return some pretty interesting. Um, I think I use interesting twice there, but really worthwhile um, scoring, scoring, uh, you know, impact. It's really interesting. There's quite a few guys who have been able to add downhill counters, I think, as far as like maybe it's a sidestep, right foot, left foot. It doesn't have to be the 45 degree angle step for the Euro step. It could be, you know, 60 or 90 or whatever, right? And to that right handed floater. And a lot of guys have the stop and pop. And that's really, really good against defenses that start gearing up against guys and running them off the three point line. And I, I actually do. I'm very optimistic that at the very least, Suggs will add that. I don't know about, you know, he'll be rapid on the pull-up and he'll have, you know, kind of these crazy pull-up numbers or growing as a player in the league like some players have been able to do. That's a really big ask, but I think he'll have that for sure. The the two-foot leaping thing is really interesting. As you say, it means you have to load up a little bit longer. You have to choose different, you know, you punch through and punch into space. You have options to attack the rim especially with really bouncy rim protectors to get the ball off the glass before they get to you to beat them to spots. You have certain angles to finish as far as counters that he uses like a pro hop, lots of pass fakes, pivots, that kind of stuff. What do you make of his counters in the lane given that he does like the, the two foot jump? I don't think he has a ton yet. Um, but again, I, I do, I do think that's an avenue he can improve because again, he, he's a very smart player. Like I think that helps a lot. Um, and I, I should say like, like 
most bat like most i mean anyone who's going to make the nba is a very smart player so i will frame it as he's a smart i think a smart player relative to his peers um because i don't i do like to be careful about that stuff i never want to call a certain player you know dumb or things like that um so i think there's an avenue for him to improve there but right now i do think his approach can be fairly rigid um which concerns me like i i, I think he was a good finisher like you know just looking at his synergy numbers um, you know, 59th percentile this year with about 43% of his shots in, in the half court coming there. Um, he shot 53 of 94 at the rim, 56.4% shooting. Um, but uh, I just, I just worry because I think there are a lot of times where he like hopeless isn't the right word, but it feels like he's almost just, he would almost just kind of try to finish the rim for the sake of it. And there wasn't really a, a plan if, if, the, if the big man was able to stay in front of them um, or go straight up, you know, there wasn't really a counter. So I think that's a, a big thing we'll have to work on. Um, and I, you know, I think, but, I, but it doesn't worry me. It's like, I, I'm really fascinated to watch his development because I think there are a lot of areas that the right training staff or developmental staff can address, not like in this, in the, you know, with the staff of a finger, but I think that could be, could, could be eradicated in pretty quick succession, whether it's a year or two years or whatnot. Um, so that's, that's where I'm interested, but the counters aren't really there for me right now. I think a lot of times he'll just kind of jump into defenders and, you know, the result is either you can finish through them or they block in, but the ball goes out of bounds. Um, but I did want to circle back to the shooting a little bit because you did ask kind of about his willingness and whatnot. Um, I realized I kind of failed to address that part of your question. Um, and I think willingness is a place he really has to improve. Um, he had, a, he tended to, especially off the catch, like he, I think he preferred to be more of a rip and go player rather than a, a stop and pop guy. Um, you know, and so I think you just like, just look, you know, looking at synergy stuff, um, and synergy, synergy by no means is the end all be all, but it has him as, uh, so he took 37, uh, catch and shoot jumpers and 68 off the dribble. Um, and I think a lot of that can speak to the fact that he was more comfortable attacking off the catch rather than shooting off the catch. Um, because he certainly had a fair share of opportunities to elevate those catch and shoot numbers. Um, but he was more prone to to attack in there. Um, so that's something that maybe, maybe you just see him tweak in a less efficient offense because, because they need it because quite frankly, Gonzaga was an incredible context for him. Um, and for all three of their prospects, the Corey Kispert, Joel Guy and Suggs there um, because it was the, the nation's best offense. So a little more margin for error to attack and maybe, maybe you draw help and Kispert's open in the corner or Drew Timmy's open for a layup. So, Things like that, I'm not super worried, but it is something worth noting that he does have to improve his willingness as a spot-up shooter as he transitions into a into a sequence, into a context that might not be or will not be as favorable as Gonzaga was this past season for him. Okay, and with just to circle back to you saying sometimes it seemed like he attacked the rim just to do it. Would it be accurate to say that he's kind of a pre-planner in what he's doing downhill? As you say, like there's not a lot of counters available to him or that he'll take. And if it speaks to a guy who also is not going to be catch and shoot, there's like this idea that guys play at their own pace and create for themselves at their own pace. That that could just be a jumble of words. I don't know if you're hearing what I'm saying. No, no, yeah, I, yeah. Um, I think when he wants to shoot at the rim, he can be pretty premeditated. Um, but I think there are times where he's a little less rigid when he's working downhill in the paint, if it's a side pick and roll or things like that. Um, but absolutely, I think he can he can kind of get you know locked into us onto a certain decision when he wants to shoot. Like I, I think back, you know, I'm going to pull a lot of examples from the most recent game I watched because I thought it was a pretty good encapsulation of kind of who he is as a prospect in certain ways. Maybe some of maybe minus some of the the, the transition flair, even though there was some of that there. Um, he was there was a play in the second half, I believe. Uh, he's attacking downhill, and he could have kind of snaked and knifed his way through the lane and found Corey Kispert for an open corner three. Um, and instead he drove, got blocked, but the ball came back to him. And in, in brilliant deal and sucks fashion, he immediately throws the ball at Corey Kispert while he's falling out of bounds and Kispert drills a three anyway. Um, but that's an example to me where you see the differing ways Suggs kind of fastball brain operates, you know, in one play he's, he's really premeditated on a certain thing and misses maybe a very, very good look for Kispert in the next, you know, Thing that somebody kind of falls into his lap and he immediately responds and makes an awesome play. So um, but I would say to answer your question succinctly, yes, he can get premeditated, especially premeditated downhill, especially when he wants, when he's determined to, to finish the rim. Um, but I don't think, and not that you're saying this, but I don't think that pervades with the entirety of how he approaches offense. Okay. 
And to loop back to transition, because we, we talked a little bit off the top of the ball in his hands, but if Kyle Lowry re-signs with the Raptors, for example, or Pascal Siakam's burgeoning grab-and-go game, which was really big for Fred Van Vliet's transition shooting, for example, what do you make of Suggs running in transition, filling lanes, finding gaps, and stuff like that? Yeah, I think I think he'll be quite good there. I think he 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 is someone who, you know, he – if the ball, if because most often Gonzaga's offense, he was the guy that they wanted having the ball in transition, right? Being mm-hmm. being the the catalyzer rather than the play finisher. But he was also good in the play finishing role, whether it was him attacking with the ball or filling the lane, you know, because they had other handlers, whether it was Joel Ayayi, Andrew Nemhard, both those guys were fellow starters and they could handle the ball as well. Um, and so I think he will be pretty good in that role because especially as you mentioned, you know, in, in the context of Toronto, they have other very good transition players, whether, you know, whether it's Kyle Lowry, if he's back, Pascal Siakam is, is fantastic as well. So I think he can be quite good there. It'll just, it's one thing that I'm curious to see because most, a lot of times he wanted to, he looked for the ball after a miss at times because he, because, because that was his role, right? That's because Gonzaga mm-hmm. trusted him to be that guy, to push the pace and, and have Kispert be the spot up guy in the corner or Joel Ayayi running the floor or a deep seal early in the offense for Drew Timmy. So I think he can be pretty adaptable there because I saw enough flashes where he would he would kind of fill the, the play finishing role in transition, but it definitely will take a little bit of adjustment. Um, but it's not something I really identify as a as a concern. Just something that I'll be monitoring. But I think I think it's something he can kind of you know he's a very malleable player in that sense. Okay, so to get even like more specific within the Raptors context, for example, Norman Powell has you know the last I would say. 18 months of basketball that he played in Toronto. He was extremely successful attacking off of a very steady diet of dribble handoffs, pin downs, and flares. So the, and a lot of teams run that. So it sounds kind of stupid to say the playbook has plays ready for Suggs to take advantage of because most teams will have that. But the context of the team also will allow the rest of the players who know how to play off of guy in those scenarios what do you make of Suggs running, you know, dribble handoffs, flares, pin downs in the context of the Raptors? So I really like the dribble handoff stuff for Suggs. I really love how he approaches those because, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, because what dribble handoffs often do is they create a subtle advantage for a ball mm-hmm. handler and big man to capitalize on, um, you know, or to shoot or things like that. But in, in Suggs' case, I think he be more of a ball handler than, you know, an off ball dynamo and the JJ Redick or or Duncan Robinson mold. But anyhow, I'm losing the plot a little bit. Um, I like him a lot in that role. Um, I, I really do. I think he's so good at taking advantage of, of preconceived advantages, as I talked about fairly extensively a little bit earlier. Um, flares and pin downs, I think it'll take a little I think I think pin downs, maybe if it's just one of those things, if it's a if it's a pin down into, you know, or a zipper cut type thing where he is where the offense is flowing into him to run a pick and roll, I like that. I don't like the idea of, of pins, pin downs and flares. I almost said flares and fin downs, my goodness. Um, pin downs and flares as much if it's trying to utilize them as an off-ball shooter yet. I think it can grow into that role, and it's something at least worth exploring, you know, in training camp or in practice or things like that. Um, but I bet I said earlier, I think he is a little – he's more he, – I don't think he'll, he'll maximize those as much as you'd like um, because he does like to drive the lane. And, you know, the Raptors, especially right now, are a team that could use a little more spacing. And so um, if Suggs is kind of wired to attack downhill every time off those plays, I don't think they'll have their full utility. Now, again, if he changes his mindset a little bit, which I think he can, um, I don't think it'll come right away. That's, it's, I mean, play style is something that can take some time to evolve and shift and usually does. Um, I think he could excel there, but not from day one. But I do like the idea of, of pin downs and DHOs for him to run pick and rolls where his defender is trailing him, not so much pin downs and flares where he, or dribble handoffs where the goal is for him to immediately come and launch off the ball uh, or launch threes or whatever. But dribble handoffs, he did a little bit of that in terms of kind of it comes like in terms of shooting. So I think he's a little more comfortable in those situations taking threes, but pin downs and flares being a quick, a quick trigger guy off the catch will require some development and work, I think. Okay, and maybe the last thing we touch on for offense, but Timmy was, you know, a major hub for offense with Gonzaga. Pascal Siakam, they seem to be leaning more into post possessions for him, 
it's a return on him becoming, I would say, you know, a top tier passer out of the post in the NBA. As far as playmaking, he grades out really highly in a lot of the metrics that weigh what type of shots you create. And he, he does, he scores very well in those metrics. Do what you will with metrics, but those are there. And he, he has a pretty good assist numbers for his position. For his utilization, you know, take it up with someone else, but I'm just trying to make the point here. Anyway, Pascal Siakam will be passing out of the post. 45 cuts were available to a lot of Raptors players this year, creeping the baseline, trying to find and hunt space, as you alluded to Suggs did earlier. That's going to be open for him. What do you make of his ability to take advantage of that at the NBA level? Yeah, I think, I, I do think he can work pretty well with Pascal, especially if they you know, continue to you know, lean into that, that post hub ability. Um, because, I mean, Timmy, Timmy was Gonzaga's main foundational player offensively in the half court, especially. They, they wanted to get the ball into him with deep seals and their pick and rolls, things like that. Um, and I think Suggs did a pretty good job of both finding Timmy and playing off of him. You know, pa- you know Timmy is a guy who is a talented passer, but doesn't always lean into it, can grow a little bit um, determined to score. And to his credit, I mean, it was a good decision most of the time because he was a fantastic player in year two, um, one of the best in the country, of course. So I, I think Pascal is a more willing passer in those situations. I think he's – because he's just – I mean, he's just a different type of post player than, than, than Timmy. Mm-hmm. So um, I do I do feel pretty confident about Suggs in that role. I like – again, I like the way that Suggs plays in space and operates space or inhabit space. Um, and so I think that will be a pretty beneficial pairing for the Raptors. Um, but it will be a bit of a different role again for, for Suggs. Um, but I think, it, I think it could be a way for Suggs to still have a decent amount of his shot diet happen at the rim. You know, if it's you know, maybe let's say he's playing in the weak side corner or the weak side wing, and, and he's, he's kind of you know, playing that cat and mouse where he ducks in a little bit and then comes back out. And then finally he cuts from the defender, you know, shades help on Pascal or something. Um, I think that he would play. He would do pretty well then, be able to score at the rim. Um, and but then, of course, the opposite is again. He'll he has to be more willing as a spot up guy um, because you can't just cut to the rim every single time, especially on him the Raptors, who you know just you know, just. I mean, it's yet to have to see where exactly what they do in the off season. But last year they had some spacing troubles at times, and the year before as well, even they were quite good. Um, so I think that will be important for him to find that balance. But I really do like the kind of the conception of how those two could work together um, because, you know, Suggs has some sort of experience in, in that role, even if Pascal and Drew Timmy are, are different kind of in how they, they work out of the post. And then just classically, what do you make of his ability to attack closeouts? Fred Van Vliet, if he's the primary initiator for the Raptors, who knows what happens with Kyle Lowry next year, but Fred is there for three more seasons or under contract for three more seasons. He passes out of drives at an extremely high rate if Suggs is sharing the floor with him, we talked about the second side pick and rolls. If it comes to a point of rest, yes, but just straight up attacking closeouts. If there's an advantage there, what do you make of that? Yeah, I, I like it for the most part. I especially think as he continues to get more comfortable in the intermediate game, he won't always have to rely on that, that two foot leap and that can really limit him. I think he'll, he'll be okay with one or two dribble pull up. He'll be good with maybe a floater as well. Like again, this year I don't want to use synergy for everything, but he was in the 97 percentile on very small sample, of course, nine of 14 um, on runners this year. But you saw him get more comfortable as the year went on. And I do think that's something that I feel pretty conf- confident uh, in in being a strength of his game is that kind of intermediate range. Um, and then, and, and also there's the fact that if you attack closeout, you don't have to be the guy who finishes the possession. And I think mm-hmm. again, a, a, if you're attacking a closeout, you have done something something has happened where the defense is, is behind the play. Um, they're on its heels, metaphorically speaking. Uh, and so I like Suggs' ability if he can, you know, if he pump fakes or he attacks to make maybe those overhead passes to the weak side or the corner for an open three or, you know, something that let's maybe, maybe someone sets a pin in the screen as Suggs is doing this and someone is open. So uh, obviously Van Vliet is very good at kind of, you know, relocating and shaking along the perimeter for open threes. So I like how that could work too. So. Um, Again, I mean, part of the issue, too, is he's going to have to warrant, you know, closeouts coming toward him, right? Uh, and I think he'll get there. But it also, again, it will require him to be a more willing spot-up guy. So I don't want to belabor that point too much, but they do go hand-in-hand, hand, of course, that um, to attack closeouts, there has to be some threat when the ball is in your hands as a spot-up guy beyond the arc. So I think he'll get there, but it could take some time for the entire, you know, kind of 
the entirety of what he can do as a closeout attacker um, really showcasing, showcasing itself. But between the intermediate game and the ability to you know find openings as a passer when the defense is tilted, I really do like how he can work as a closeout attacker. Okay, and one more question. Just I, Somebody asked me to ask this, uh, a commenter. Do you think that Suggs is a player who, and this is a very silly thing to ask perhaps, but is maybe primed for any rapid skill progression because he had his focus elsewhere in life? I don't, I don't think so really. Um, because again, because one of the things is he's a tremendously smart um, player. I think if you saw, you know, again, compared to his, his peers, in my opinion, um, I think if you saw some areas where you could refine kind of the way he approaches the game in terms of kind of just seeing things on the floor, then, then yes. Um, but I mean, he's, he's been playing basketball since I mean, very young. Um, I wrote a story about him last April um, and just talking with him and his dad, like basketball has been part of his upbringing for a long, long time. So even if it wasn't his full time, you know, passion, you know, from, from day one, he, he's been in, he's been entrenched in the sport for a long time. And so I don't think there's any sort of, he, I don't think he's, he's short on, on basketball education at this point. Um, and so I think any, any skill development that comes rapidly will be a testament to him and kind of maybe the, the way that some of the areas that I've identified that are, you know, could be, could be relatively attainable, uh, relatively easily attainable, excuse me, um, areas of development, but not because he's, because he just started playing basketball full time after quitting football a year and a half ago or anything like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think we're agreed on that. And if anybody wants to know about how playing other invasion sports might be beneficial to your development in basketball, just because of how your brain chunks this kind of stuff together. Uh, a really good follow is easy, uh, easy underscore hoops on uh, Twitter, Evan Zocha, who talks about this stuff all the time. It's very good. Mm-hmm. But When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all your hiring in one place, even interviewing. Indeed helps you hire great people fast. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Are you ready to do some defense, Jackson? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is point of attack defense. Everybody knows what it looks like. You're on ball. We, like you said, he's, he was pretty good at the collegiate level, but projecting into the NBA, and I know projecting is like a fool's errand, but what you've seen so far, how does he utilize his help defenders? Is he good at containing live dribblers, like particularly guys who are potent? How does he deny passing lanes, whether it's in the pick and roll or just guys who are trying to pass to the sidelines? What is he cutting off? What is he allowing? And then screen navigation pluck and go at any rate you wish through those things. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll start with screen navigation. I think that's something he definitely has to improve. He had a, had a tendency to kind of just ram into uh, to screens at times, um, which is obviously not ideal, but at the same time, but Gonzaga also was a pretty switch heavy screen s- scheme one through four, at least like they would switch for Timmy at times, um, but it wasn't what their, it wasn't their preference all the time. And so I think, I think some of the, maybe the, the lack of perceived lack of days go screen navigation was just the idea that like in college, Hey, like if I switch on to this big man, I'm probably not going to get beat because, you know, not because a lot of guys at the college level aren't super skilled and you know, able to exploit switches like that. So um, certainly kind of an area of, of, I would, that I would highlight and monitor. Um, but not something that I'm like, oh, it's a huge issue, but I do think the screen navigation has to improve. Um, but, but so the screen navigation has to improve, but I'm not, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is I don't think the lack of urgency at times is like some huge concern, it's just something to monitor because it could have been due to the switch, switch heavy nature and the lack of, you know, super skilled players that are positioned in college. Um, because again, it does tie back into this, the lack of the poor screen navigation, I think ties into his kind of my, per, my perception that he's a bit inflexible in the upper body. Um, I, when I was watching a game this morning, um, to kind of jog memory some more, I, I tweeted out, or I guess it was this afternoon, excuse me, on Thursday here, um, that I say, I see a lot of similarities between him and Alonzo Ball um, in certain areas. And I think he'll be a, I think he'll be a better player with Alonzo Ball. Um, but Alonzo Ball is a very good player, a, very, a good player. 
Um, but because I've been watching a lot of Lonzo Ball as well, because I'm going to write about him, Lonzo struggles with screen navigation. I think a lot of it is because of his inflexibility. So I see similarities there. I don't know how much that can be improved. Uh, it's a little bit outside my realm of expertise. I'm not really a biomechanics guy. Uh, if we're going to do shout outs here, Polar Fall on Twitter, at Polar Fall mm-hmm. would be your would be the best person to ask about that if Raptors fans wondering how they can, how Jalen can improve navigating his screens with flexibility and improvements. Um, that's where I would go, but that's the thing I worry about a good amount. Um, but he, but I, so, but I think in that regard, if you want to limit how often he has to navigate screens, you can run some ice coverage some put some push coverage where you force the ball away from the screen. Um, and in that, in that way, I think Sug can be quite useful um, because he can get pretty, pretty, overwhelming laterally um he is very strong for a guard especially one who's just recently turned 20 years old um is able to cut off screen to absorb contact has pretty good body balance i guess just balance excuse me <laughs> um but uh pretty good core strength too which you know, ties into balance of course so um those are things i like about his defense on the ball um in terms of kind of help defenders it was hard to know exactly how he utilized them again because gonzaga was pretty quick to just you know see a switch um, because most of the time they had more talent than the opposition uh, this past year. Um, and so I don't have a great sense of that because I don't think it was something he was asked to do a ton of because Gonzaga, like I said, would just switch things rather than you know, rely on actual help defenders a lot. Um, but that's how I view kind of his point of attack defense at this, at this juncture. Good, but I don't think he's the guy you want to be your kind of your premier stopper. But luckily, uh, if he goes to Toronto, um, he won't have to worry about that because he will have both Fred Van Vliet and OG Ananobi to, OG Ananobi to cover for him in, in those regards. Yeah, at, at best, in a couple of years, Suggs would be you know, probably guarding the second or third most potent perimeter player on the ball. Yeah, I, I have a tweet of yours queued up. It's well, a two-parter. The FVV Suggs OG Siakam defensive <laughs> quartet is smothering, and this is speaking to the limitations we touched on at the top of the podcast, not just for Suggs either, but for the Raptors as a whole. No advantage creation for this, themselves or opponents, just <laughs> vibes. So I think it's safe to say you expect that interplay between those four to be quite potent defensively. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really do like the defense for the, for there. Um, I mean, obviously OG is OG. You had a very strong case for all defenses here if he hadn't you know, missed so much time, unfortunately. Um, Fred and Lee had a strong case this year as well. Um, I think, you know, I, I think most Robert fans will know this, but in probably you know, feel similarly, but I think Fred had one of the, one of the most underrated seasons in the NBA this year. Um, but especially defensively, just what he can do, whether it's on the ball, those digs, those stunts, he's just so, just so good in an array of ways. Um, so I really do like that. Um, and, and off the ball, Suggs has a tendency to be a little too prone to risks. He likes to float a lot and try and hunt plays. Um, and so I wonder how much, I wonder what the balance will, he will be asked to strike in the NBA for a team like Toronto that has a lot of defenders to, to cover up things. I mean, Pascal and OG at their peak are two of the better kind of perimeter ground coverage guys. Um, when you talk about ground coverage, a lot of times you think of the, you know, the, the Rudy Gobert, the DeAndre Ayton, the Joel Embiid's, but obviously Pascal and OG can cover a lot of space in a, in a small amount of time. So. Um, I'm curious how that works out, but Suggs does have really good instincts. He's great at baiting the offenses into kind of making plays that you think might be there that end up not being there. Um, but he can he can get kind of infatuated with with playing that free safety role. And that, that dates back to high school too. It's not just a, a thing at Gonzaga that, that he did. So um, I, I do want to monitor that. It's something that right now I do kind of view as a as a concern to an extent. Everything when I say it, like another thing else, I'm trying to couch as, as monitoring without worrying. But it is something I do worry a little bit about because um, in the NBA you have so much less time to just time and space to do things. Um, you, you just can't really kind of play off as far of, of guys because most guys are, are more talented than who you're guarding in 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 college or wherever you play before getting to the NBA. So. Um, I really do like the instincts and his ability to play free safety, but I think he could, he, he's going to have to clean that up and be a little more disciplined or significantly more disciplined to really maximize those off ball just instincts. Hopefully the Raptors are good next year and maybe we get a Philly Raptors series so you and I can finally sit down and have the <laughs> Matisse OG debate that I think everybody, everybody wants to hear. But we talked last year on a podcast and you brought up that Jason Tatum might be 
Well, you said he might be one of the best nailed defenders, if not the best nailed defender in the NBA. What do you make of Suggs in that position? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I do think Suggs... <laughs> I was going to combine... Uh, Statum. Stunt and, yeah, I was going to say a stunt and, and Suggs. I'm going to combine it into, into one phrase there. I do think Suggs is pretty good at stunt in a recovery situation because I do like his short area quickness, which ties back to... You know, if you have him force him to fall him would reject a screen, he can really kind of cover ground if they try and reject the screen and get downhill away from it. Um, and so I, li- I do like him there. I don't think he has the length to be a great nail defender. Um, some of the best nail defenders, I mean, Tatum has pretty great length. Um, and, I mean, okay, Tatum's length itself isn't great, but the intersection of size and mobility is the big thing there. He's like 6'10 mm-hmm. or whatever at this point. Great um, Mikel too. Bridges is another, is another really, really good nail defender. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple others this year. I don't. I don't think Tatum was quite as good this year. Um, OG, of course, there's another one that I think is a fantastic nail defender. Um, and he has the same thing where he's just a ginormous, he, he's just ginormous and mobile. Um, and so I think, I think Suggs can be good there, but I don't think he's going to necessarily rank among the best because I think his wingspan is about neutral. I want to say it's maybe six, four and a half, six, five. And he stands about six, four in shoes. Um, and so it's just, I mean, just length matters a lot on both sides of the ball and, and that can even tie back into the finishing side of things offensively. He doesn't quite have that, that length to finish around guys when things don't go great, which ties into his counters there. So um, I like him because of his short area of quickness in stunt recovery situations, whether it's, you know, he's in the strong side corner and someone drives and he has to maybe, maybe deter the drive or a shot at the rim, but also close out on the strong side shooter. I think he can do that pretty well. Um, but I don't think he'll be an elite nail defender because he just doesn't have the length there. It's, I mean, it's just very tough to be, his size, everyone I mentioned here is either has a huge wingspan or is at least, you know, six, seven, six, eight and super mobile or, and some of them are both. So uh, just, just a really, just a really high bar to clear when you're six, four and he doesn't quite have the, the length to compensate there with his wingspan. Suggs, if he's going to be on the Raptors and the Raptors don't, if they don't move much from what they've been trying to do the last couple of years, he's likely going to be asked to gang rebound on this team more so than with other teams, just because of how the Raptors play. There's going to be more scram switching, more maniacal and insane closeouts. You talked about ground coverage, Siakam. Maybe, like, I know Debona Sabonis had the most distance traveled, I think, in the <laughs> NBA, which <laughs> that's absurd. And Caitlin Cooper documented that in a fantastic way this year. But Siakam also, one of the preeminent ground coverage guys, uh, Suggs will probably have to do a lot of that if he's on these Raptors. What do you make of gang rebounding, scram switching, crazy closeouts for him, how he ties into all that? I like the first two. I think he I think he attacks the boards really well. Some of that ties into his transition prowess. He likes to get on the glass and kind of, you know, let himself attack there. Um, so I think he does attack the glass very well uh, in that sense. So I think he's another guy that maybe can play a little bit bigger than than himself on the boards. Um, obviously, Fred Van Vliet's great at that. Kyle Lowry's been great at that for years. Um, and so I think you could add Suggs to maybe the next the next uh, next Raptors guard who play who plays bigger than the size on the glass. Um, scram switches, I do like. I think he battles pretty well on switches. Um, I think he's good about getting pretty low, trying to you know get low center of gravity and push guys out. Is physical, of course. Like that's that's one of the things I like most I, um, about him is he plays pretty physically, and I think that isn't always the case with guards, especially younger guards. Um, if I if I can kind of tie this, the one thing I'd like to see more offensively is that. I think he can play through the post a little bit. Um, a guy that I that I don't that I don't think he compares to overall, um, but in this one sense is Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday loves to play through the post. Um, as a smaller guy, I think Sugg can do something similar in terms of maybe being that's probably his best avenue to self creation if you're going to try to find one and be using the strength of the post. Um, I don't want to go on to it too much, but I did want to mention that I think it's an important thing for his self creation is the fact he's very strong and has shown a little bit of a post game at times. Um, scram, uh, in terms of kind of ground coverage, I don't know how great he'll be there because again, he's just working from a length you know, deficit. He's about mm-hmm. six four with about a neutral wingspan, which makes it tough. The other guys you mentioned here, um, you know, are, you know, are Siakam and, and OG in this realm. Um, and so I think he'll be okay there. I think he can be a pretty good closeout guy. Like I like his ability to decelerate. The change of pace offensively is pretty good too. And so I think that could you know, bode well or portend well for his his deceleration on closeouts because that's a really important thing is being able to decelerate quickly. Um, If we're going to tie it back to maybe something you can watch for these finals, Chris Paul has been excellent about closeouts all year, basically, especially in these playoffs. 
does a great job of recovering the shooters without being too overeager. Um, and so I think Suggs could be pretty solid in that regard. Um, but truthfully, something I don't have a great feel for um, because it is such a nuanced skill um, to really find. I don't know if I feel great about saying one way or the other, but just based on some of the other things that I've seen in terms of physical tools and approach, I think it could be a strength of his, which is a benefit because um, quite frankly, even most players in the NBA are, are not good at closeouts. Okay. And actually just, there was one thing that came up when you're talking about that strength creation, strength advantage creation. Kyle mm-hmm. Lowry is a guy on the Raptors who he doesn't have that wide dribble. He doesn't play with the ball outside of himself, but it's more not just in the post on occasion. I know there's, there's some big shots he's hit out of a post fade and there's been countless times where he's smashed a big man basically into the stanchion, that type of shot creation. Is there, is there anything for Suggs to learn? And do you think those are things that he could apply to his own game? I, th- I think the, if, you, if, you, if you're viewing it through the lens of Kyle Lowry, I think the thing that Lowry does really well that maybe Suggs could you know, borrow or apply to himself is I, I love how Lowry will keep defenders locked onto his hip um, especially mm-hmm. in transition, like I mean, I, there, there's so many times where where Lowry gets the guy on his hip at the the opposing three point line and just keeps them there the entire way, and then kind of his very last step, he leans into them, creates a little space, and then just kind of lofts a finish over them. Um, and so obviously, Kyle Lowry has a has a lower center of gravity than Suggs. Um, he just that's one of his best strengths um, is his strength and kind of where he's able to to leverage that. Um, but I do think that's something Suggs could use is kind of getting guys on his hips with his strength um, and kind of not allowing them to take the ball away from him there. Um, so that, that would be my biggest thing is, is that is that sort of thing is protecting the ball if it's on his right side, um, keeping a guy locked onto his left hip, whether it's in a pick and roll or a transition play. Uh, those would be the, those, that would be the biggest thing that um, I think he could take away there. Um, and, and for his sake, I think it would be awesome if Lowry signs and he got to he got to learn from Lowry for a couple of years. Um, obviously, Lowry is much smaller than him, but um, just a lot of things you can take away from from guys who um, you know use strength from a guy who uses who long used his strength to to get places offensively that maybe he couldn't get otherwise. Well, that's a great point. Lowry's manipulation of lanes in transition with his physicality to handle and keep wings and big men out of the lanes he wants not preoccupied is one of the maybe the most enjoyable things that I've been able to watch covering the team over these past few years. It's, it's really masterful. He'll just lead guys into dunks with that physicality and that awareness of it. But is there anything else you want to talk about with Suggs that you think people should know about with him and his game? I, I think we covered pretty in depth here. Um, nothing else really comes to mind. Just, just that strength thing I want to touch on. Um, I really do want to – I really am curious to see how he develops any sort of post game in, in the NBA. Um, now, the big differentiator between him and Drew is I think Drew's wingspan, I want to say, is maybe 6'10". Let me double-check here quickly. But um, the underlying point here that remains true regardless of the actual measurement is that he has a much longer wingspan than than Suggs. Um, so he's at 6'7", so I definitely overestimated 6'10", but still longer than Suggs. Um, and Drew does use that length pretty well around the basket. I know it's been been tough sliding for Drew in these playoffs, but – um, he definitely does typically use his length very well around the rim. Um, but that is one thing I would like to see him explore. Like if I'm, if I'm him, if I'm Suggs, I'm watching a lot of Drew Holiday because Drew is great about using his strength to create advantages there. Um, but everything else, I think we, we hit on pretty in depth. I think, I mean, I, I mean, I'm fine calling this the definitive, definitive Suggs bottle. I'll toot my own horn this one time, but, uh, but I, I don't think anything else comes to mind. I really do think this was, this was a really in-depth kind of hopefully holistic picture of everything, you know, good and, and good and good. I won't say bad. I'll say good and needs improvement and everything in between for Jalen Suggs. Yeah. I think the, the Drew Holiday as a reference point is really, really a strong one, especially given how they both play. And especially since Suggs will have the chance to grow his game alongside the league, whereas the league kept changing and drew there are parts of his game that are a little bit more out of fashion. Suggs can grow with it. And so, you know, the, the parts of Drew's game that have been a little bit, what's the, there's a diminishing return because of spacing and because of how he's being played. Suggs can kind of, he can bounce back against that with his own skill development as a really young guy. So that's great. But I I was going to ask you if it felt definitive, but you came right away and you said, Hey, (laughs) it does feels definitive to me. 
thank you so much for your time, Jackson. The floor is yours to plug, plug, plug away anything you like. Uh, I don't have any pieces right now to plug. I've been in the process of moving the last couple of days, um, but I'm settled now. And so uh, I'll be settling in to watch game two of the NBA finals. And I'm sure I'll have something uh, from that, from kind of my, my thoughts on the first two games, however it goes, maybe, maybe Milwaukee's tied it up and I'll write about why that happened or Phoenix is taking a 2 lead and break that part down. But you can find all of my work uh, in my bio on Twitter at Jack Frank underscore DJF. Uh, I do a lot of podcasting about the Sixers and I do a lot of NBA writing in general, uh, anywhere listed in my bio, which is primarily the two places, Sam, uh, that you, uh, that you listed at the top of the hour here. Um, the dime up rocks and the analysts, my goodness, I was spacing on the two places that I write most of my content these days, but I uh, appreciate having me <laughs> on. And I hope for everyone, for everyone listening that it was an insightful, uh, breakdown of, of Suggs because, I will just I will just end that Suggs is a very good prospect, and if the Raptors do get him, um, they should be his, their fans uh, should be very encouraged and excited about what he brings. Oh, they should be freaking the hell out! And I, I imagine <laughs> that uh, everybody who listens to this should be really happy with the content that we've provided. And just as you know, I do this for a lot of people that come on the podcast, and it's because I'm very lucky that the the higher ups. The Blake Murphys, the Zarar Siddiqui's say, hey, Sam, you have whoever you want on the pod. And so I get to invite people I revere for their work. And Jackson's is just unbelievably high quality stuff. As you heard, I referenced pieces that are a year old or that are four months old. And it's because I read his work because there's things to learn and there's things to enjoy and just a super fresh way to put things out. I really enjoy Jackson's stuff. You should follow him on Twitter because he's also extremely generous about the insights he puts out on there. It's not just stuff that you have to click a link to get to. You can follow his Twitter and you could learn tons and tons and tons and enjoy the game through his lens. But Jackson, thank you so much for coming on the definitive Jalen Suggs podcast. <laughs> there it is, the definitive Jalen Suggs podcast. Yes, appreciate you having me on. Appreciate all the kind words. And uh, Again, I hope for everyone listening, this gave a great picture of everything Jalen Jalen Suggs currently brings and could bring into the future. Okay. And if you're getting into this in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye.